this is a uh, seminar uh, from SAFPAC um, and we're, we're very, very pleased to have Robert here, Robert Snell. Robert's been involved with us over the years. If we, our program has transitioned to University of Surrey and then to University of Roehampton, where he's very much involved. And now I'm very pleased to say he's, um, uh, he's uh, an honorary member of SAP. <laughs> besides that, Robert is also an art historian and psychotherapist and is uh, um, very, very, very acknowledged in the field of, of art and psychotherapy. So delighted for, for Robert to, um, to, to be here today and hand over to you, Robert, to, to say a bit more, please, about your talk. Thank you very much, Dill, for your, for your kind welcome. Um, I just came in on the, on the end of the discussion. It, it, it was so interesting. I, I don't know your name, whoever was talking, but it was absolutely spot on, I thought, what you were saying. And I, I hope those are themes we can pick up in the talk and in the discussion. Um, just, just to say a little bit about the starting point for this. It, I, I gave this talk to a, a group called the Arts Forum of Psychotherapy Sussex. I'm, I'm Brighton based a couple of weeks ago and the idea came from an article in the Guardian by Jonathan Jones on um, what was then a forth, forthcoming major Goya exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York called Goya's Graphic Imagination. Uh, so that's the first inspiration for it. Since then there's been, there was a wonderful review in the Financial Times last weekend which if you have not thrown away your copies of the FT I do recommend to you. Um, I don't know if the, the dark days of January the 6th seem, seem quite a long way away on a spring morning like, like today, but perhaps they're not so far away in our minds after all. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not wanting to claim in this talk that, um, that Goya uh, offers us any clear answers or lessons. Uh, can we get him on? Can I? Can you enable me to share, Del? I'll get him on the screen, get some pictures on the screen. Good. Yeah, well, perhaps Goya, who lived from 1746 to 1828, can, can at least help us register the impact of the events of, of the 6th of January 2021, and perhaps feel a bit less alone in a historical desert. He offers us a sort of commentary perhaps like an analyst who's powerless to do anything else with a patient in great pain and confusion, except to say something like, yes, that's what it's like. And he may in this way be able to help us see and think a bit more clearly, just when events and the emotions they stir up can feel at their most overwhelming. But first I need to make a major qualification, and it's a historical one. The conditions Goya lived in are in many important ways not our conditions. The 18th century Spain into which Goya was born was a largely feudal pre-capitalist society. Um, it was a, a land of folk, folk culture rather than high culture and certainly not mass culture. Um, very poor communications, high massive illiteracy, high levels of poverty, uh, and subsist, subsist, subsistence being the norm for the majority of the population. It was in the process of losing a once vast empire. Um, it was ruled by an immensely powerful church and a landed aristocracy. So it was hardly the United States of advanced or late capitalism of mass culture, mass and social media, universal literacy, um, the presence of rights in the inverted commas and the rule of law. Uh, and certainly this 18th century Spain didn't have the United States consciousness of its own vast economic power and world role, albeit currently under threat. This is Goya, you know, self-portrait of 1815 in the Prado. I'll just leave, leave that image to, to linger in, in your minds. It suggests, well, there's a woundedness about him, I think, a thoughtfulness. And a clear-sightedness as he looks at himself. 
We'll see in a minute what he was up to in 1815. So if conditions are different, the imagery of the rioting crowd and maybe the mob experience itself show very little change. In these two pictures, we see a tumbling and climbing mass. There seems to be a very uh, a regressive experience going on for participants as well as for viewers. And something about the tension between the sheer force of gravity, physical gravity, and aspiration, a wish to climb towards something or out of something. The painting at the top is not by Goya, but by a German painter who worked in Britain called Johann Zoffany. And believe it or not, um, it shows an episode from the French Revolution of 1789. It represents the plundering of the royal wine cellar. But between that time and now, there are direct, more chilling and often deliberately orchestrated echoes. And here's the noose, which you were talking about just now. And at the top, uh, a, a, a print from 1793, showing the scaffold in the Place de la Concorde in Paris, where Marie Antoinette, the queen, was about to lose her head. Absolutely chilling, that image at the bottom, with its particularly American resonances, gibbets and, and slavery. And, uh... There's no doubt that the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution, 1789 and onwards, of the late 18th century, remain central reference points for us today as events without which the world we now live in could not have taken the shape it has. Confusing, challenging, dynamic, mobile, humanist, largely speaking, democratic, hopefully, sometimes, not always, pluralistic, with the tremendous achievements and work in progress of feminism, anti-racism, multiculturalism, all that on the one hand, and on the other, a contemporary world which is driven towards despotism and a longing for authority, identity, stasis, tradition, monoculture and order, which is a powerful subcurrent, I think many of us would agree, uh, to, to Brexit and, and certainly to Trumpism in the United States. So we're caught between, between two worlds, toward, between two powerful uh, emotional, psychological forces which manifest in different political forms. Well, here's a man of the late 18th century who also looks very much like he might be caught between two worlds. Here's a much earlier self-portrait of Goya made in 1798 at the end of the, the French Revolutionary decade. Goya was living in Madrid at this time and here he is painting himself not full face, but from the side, which is quite difficult to do if you're trying to make a self-portrait. But looking askance, looking at us out of the side of his eye, the corner of his eye. What, what? Uh, he seems to be inviting us to wonder what earth he might be seeing out of the corner of his eye. Us, presumably. So, Francisco José de Joya y Lucientes. Even his name, Yoja, and then the word luciente, which is a Spanish adjective for shining, it means shining. The contrast between just the sounds of his name might suggest how far he was caught in an in-between. On the one hand, the dark earthiness of Yoja, and then the polished and enlightened sound of luciente, lucientes, which is his matronym, his mother's name, of course. He was born the son of a master gilder, so he came from an artisanal class, slightly, slightly above a peasant, but still essentially a servant, not yet free to sell his own labour. That's the background from which Goya came. He grew up in rural Aragon in northern Spain, near Saragossa. And it was very much the world of the village bullfight, popular culture and customs, superstitions, folklore, and belief in the supernatural, in witches, demons, sprites, giants, Ogres. And this is an etching from much later in his career, showing an ogre. 
something that runs throughout his work is this contrast between the weight of bodies and gravity, mass, and lightness. His work is also full of flying figures, like this, which is presumed to be the Duchess of Alba, with whom legend has it Goya had a love affair, but that's by no means certain. There's as you have seen just from these two images, there's a tremendous vitality and physical sensation throughout Goya's work. So the immaterial spectres, like an ogre or flying demons and witches, have a convincing, palpable uh, reality. What Goya also seems to show us is what later became known as the real Spain, as particularly marketed by the fascist dictator, General Franco, uh, when he opened up Spain to foreign tourism, which is a massive source of, um, uh, of income for Spain in the 1960s. So this idea of the real Spain as a land of, of, of castanets, you see the ogres playing castanets even, um, of machos and machas, of the bullfight, and of a land of difference, the marketing of difference. Goya is very much in the background of this, but the real Spain that Goya painted was, was not this commodified version of Spain, it really was, really was his culture. We'll, we'll come back to the question of the, a real Spain or a real America or a real Britain later on. But we're leaping ahead of ourselves chronologically. Let's return to the 1790s and just briefly look at Goya's own trajectory, which was to, to turn himself from an artisan artist working only to commission to one of the, the very first artists, one of the, the very first truly modern artists in the sense that he became, he, he, he established a way of selling his work on an open market. So the idea of the, of the free artist, the romantic genius, working only from inspiration is really born around this time and born with figures, notable figures such, such as Goya. At this time, though, this is from the early 1790s, he was very much working to commission. And of course, artists continue to work to commission. This is um, not his earliest work by a long way, but it's an example of the sort of tapestry design through which he really made his mark among wealthy patrons in the 1780s and 90s. And it shows a popular pastime, but framed in a way that's fit for aristocratic consumption. A straw man being tossed around by a group of girls or by fate. One could read it in all kinds of allegorical ways. Another way of reading it might be to think that it's a knowing commentary on contemporary gender politics. But it also has more than a hint of something darker in the gleeful jouissance of the young women. The um, Financial Times reviewer of the New York exhibition has this wonderful sentence, Goya upholsters his violence with the fabric of seduction. And that, as we'll see, catches precisely, I think, what, what he was able to do. And it's very important for our theme this morning, the jouissance, the seduction, the eroticism of, of violence. In the 1790s, um, Goya was the painter for the Royal Court in Madrid. Um, really climbing up uh, his, the career pole. And as a result of that, moving among the most uh, educated and advanced thinkers in the Spain of that time. This is a, a friend of his, a man called Gaspar Melchior Jovellanos, painted in 1798 very much a representative of a new small bourgeois class and of 18th century enlightenment. At this time, uh, Jovellanos was actually Minister of Education. Um, education, of course, being a key word in the whole European and American enlightenment project. Las luces in Spanish, lights. 
these, the values of enlightenment were precisely those that produced the United States Constitution in 1776. Men and women such as Jovellanos looked towards Britain and France above all. They were known as Frenchified, Afrancesados, for example. Uh, they looked to Locke and Rousseau, Voltaire and Adam Smith for models of social, educational, legal, economic and economic development based on a marriage of sensibility and compassion and the principles of reason, all directed towards an increase in human happiness, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And here's Hawaiianos shown by Goya to be embodying precisely this marriage. On the one hand, he has all the instruments of reason and of learning, pens, papers, he's holding a letter in his hand. The goddess Athene, the goddess of wisdom, presides over his, his desk. But he's also in a very dreamy state. and he was, he was indeed a poet and writer. He seems to be lost in a sort of rather melancholy reverie. And notice the very polite pose of, of his legs. This is very much a late 18th century trope. This was, a, this was a, a polite way to sit in a smart salon or in the royal palace. And it was in the royal palace that Goya himself was moving. Here he, here he is in 1801. There he is behind the royal family, behind his easel, a great homage to his great predecessor, Velasquez. He's now at the height of his success. He's 44. He's now first court painter for the reforming monarchy of Charles IV, Carlos IV, and Queen Maria Luisa. Here they are. And keep an eye on this chap. This is the Prince of Asturias, the heir to the throne. We'll be seeing him again in a minute. But even the royal family look a bit like puppets, as if they might be the mannequins tossed in the blanket of history. Humans are always subject to some other force in Goya. We are not masters in our own palaces. Even though he wasn't present at it, the central political event of Goya's life, literally in the middle of it, was the great revolution that started in France in 1789, bringing with it something we too can now get a taste of, at least a little, a sense of the utterly unprecedented. The trial and the execution of a, of a monarch, the most powerful monarch in Europe, Louis XVI of France um, was an unthinkable event to most educated Europeans. And this happened in 1792, the year in which Goya painted the mannequin. The French executed their own king and queen. Now the, the Spanish monarchy escaped this fate, but in Spain actually the worst was yet to come. North in Paris, the so-called reign of terror in 1793 to 4, with its mass arrests, mass guillotinings of aristocrats, um, royalty, priests in particular, overlapped with the central event of Goya's personal life, <clears throat> an illness in 1792 and 3 that caused him violent hallucinations and left him at the age of 37 permanently deaf. After his recovery in 1799, he offered for sale a series of prints known as Los Caprichos, the Caprices, and this is one of them. So he is offering something for sale independently on, on an open market. But what exactly is this? What are we looking at? What are these so consummately executed, inventively composed etchings and aquatints? Goy was the first printmaker, first etcher to use aquatint as that's this way of making shadow, as you see in the sky here, for example. No one had done this before, so technically they're extraordinarily inventive. But what are they? Is this enlightened satire, is this part of the Enlightenment project, which we know Goya associated himself with? Are they part of an attempt to drag Spain into the, into the 18th century in its closing moments? 
Or are they images of, of hallucination, evidence of hallucinosis? Certainly, Spanish Enlightenment figures were drawn towards graphic satire, especially on British models, the work of Hogarth, Gilray, Rowlandson. Satire was a key tool for Enlightenment, enlightened reformers, a way of showing up society's errors, areas where it could do better. But no one since Bruegel or Bosch in the late Middle Ages had ever produced anything as strange and disturbing as this. And what's more, they have unsettling captions. It's not clear if Goya gave them these titles or one of his enlightened friends. This one is called Snitches. Soplones. It does seem that Goya's illness opened him up, opened the doors of perception to all kinds of subliminal, tangential, unconscious messages, things seen out of the corner of his eye from the wider social, political and cultural field. And he never looked back on, from, from this point. Perhaps a bit like catching the transference sickness from a whole society and entering the world, the field of trance and dream in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, which of course we do our best to try and do. In fact, the caprichos were originally going to be entitled sueños, dreams. And here's the most famous and much reproduced of all. The sleep of reason produces monsters, says, says the caption here on Goya's desk. Note the pose of his legs. It's Hovayanus' pose. It's that polite pose. There we have 18th century sensibility and calm and tranquility and reason in the bottom half. But above, something else is, is breaking loose. The Caprichos plunges into a highly metaphorical world full of ambiguity and shot through with anxiety. And the sleep of reason is ex exemplary in this. Reason and delusion are now held in tension and embodied in a single man, a man struck down. There is a body language at work. And the message is not quite as simple as it might at first seem. The light of civilized reason will drive out the darkness of barbarous irrationality. There's a, a, a printed text that goes with the print, which, which says something along the lines of, imagination united with reason is the mother of all wonders, but when they're separated, monsters appear. So that's the overt content, the message of the, of the print, but it doesn't actually seem to do that. The light of civilized, civilized reason does not actually seem to be driving out darkness and irrationality. On the, other, on, on the contrary, it's crowding in on the enlightened sleeping artist. The rays of the sun drive out the night, as Sarastro sings in Mozart's Magic Flute of 1791. The masculine authority of reason drives out the crazed woman, the queen of the night. But Goya's creatures of the night, bats, owls, cats, are very real and they look unwilling to be driven out anywhere. Perhaps what Guy was suggesting, and I, I think he is, is that it's reason itself that can also be the dream. The dream of reason. Reason too can be delusional. And that reason too can give rise to nightmares, particularly when it starts from certain premises or beliefs and is not awake and alert to feeling and what we might call common sense, that is a sense of our commonality of human beings. And this is especially so, of course, when such premises are cloaked as, as science. Think of eugenics, you know, the whole horror of 19th and 20th and 21st century uh, racial theories. For example, the premise that immigrants cause contagious diseases and unemployment, that they are sponges, rapists and criminals. A reasonable response for this might be, well, build a border wall to keep them out, using all the fruits of reason's achievements in the realm of science and technology. 
electrify the wall and build in high-tech surveillance and alarms. Discourage them further by building detention camps for those who do get through and separate the children from their mothers the more easily to send them back so that they do not grow into a new generation of rapists and criminals. Reason has nothing if not foresight. So it is not reason but human feeling, empathy and concern that is put to sleep so that it can no longer function as a guide and a check to action or a stimulus to curiosity and inquiry. It is a death of imagination and I think that's what Goya is reminding us of, as if we needed reminding. The overt claim of Los Caprichos was precisely to combat false beliefs. He wrote a whole manifesto saying what it was for. Uh, it didn't get past the Inquisition, however, and he had to withdraw it from the sale. But that was his aim, to combat false beliefs and premises, superstitions, lies, and what we would call post-truth. But instead of doing this directly, he shows us a disturbingly indeterminate and in-between world. In other words, we're, there is ambiguity. Which, which, which side of the illusion is it? Is it reason that's sleeping or imagination that's sleeping? The ambiguity remains. Investigate the caesura, said the great British psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion. That is the border, the borderline. Not one side or the other, but the in-between. The two together and the dividing, linking line between them. Reason, imagination, dark light, conscious, unconscious. Goya's work indeed is full of um, malignant symbiosis and hybridity, two things brought together, of masks and two-facedness, of very unclear borders indeed. There's Goya on the top, couple welded together, unable to part, an unbreakable caesura between them, and here's, here's another nasty hybrid. The picture below shows the 45th President of the United States and the King of Europe embracing. But I'm jumping forward again. Let's go back to the Caprices briefly and to some telling contemporary echoes. What will he die of is the caption to this one. It would, on the surface, it would seem to be a, a satire on doctors, um, a statement about distrust of the medical profession. But is Goya's message so straightforwardly anti-doctor? Or is it a picture of false belief? Is it a satire on um, the people who nowadays would claim that vaccinations are the work of the devil? A satire on anti-vaxxers. They want to put microchips in us so they can control us as part of a world conspiracy. Well, I, I, I think he's challenging a false belief again. Here are two contemporary prints by the British uh, artist, satirist, uh, satirist Crookshank, which show um, reactions to the, the, the very first vaccine, the smallpox vaccination invented by Jenner in the years around the turn of the 18th, 19th centuries. For and against vaccination. In the top one, we have the anti-vaxxers point of view. These, these bits of cow that get vaccinated into people, injected into people, well, look what happens. You grow horns, you give birth to cows, you shit, shit cows. That's what, that's what they're doing to us. On the other hand, Cruikshank is perfectly capable of taking the opposite view and showing Jenner as a hero, doing what the Enlightenment would approve of, driving out irrationality, supporting the reason of science. What Goya does, I think, is give us both points of view, but condensed in one image, as in, as in the Freudian dream, for and against doctors. He certainly does seem to be speaking directly in some of the caprices about the horror of living with a closed mind. Las chinchillas, I think that means to spoil for rich kids, something like that. 
he, he shows these figures with closed ears and eyes, closed senses and sensibilities. He alerts us to the ever-present danger of being deaf, blind, and spoon-fed who knows what. And here are the Clintons and their satanic, child-abusing, sex-trafficking ring of evil Democrats eating some babies. This is called, There's a Lot to Suck, Mucho Ay Que Chupar. They suck the blood out of your children, those, those Democrats, those ghastly liberals. And the, uh, the, 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 the Financial Times reviewer, Ariella Budick is her name, uh, writes this about this print. A ghastly trio enjoys snuff after a meal of dead babies. The leftovers fill a doggy basket at their feet. Now, you, you, you will be aware that the, the idea that um, the Clintons and, and, and others are part of a world conspiracy of, of, of satanic child abuse, child abusing um, sex fiends is one that's held very seriously by very, very many Americans very many supporters of Donald Trump. So, these are just some of the virally contagious pieces of disinformation that can hold us in thrall. And Goya shows a lot of holding in thrall going on. This one's called, it's a, it's a, it, look what a tailor can do. Whether this is about um, a, a superstitious a way of trying to conceive or a way of trying to get rid of babies abort them I, I, I'm not sure but it shows another another folk belief that, that Goya is iron, ironizing but again with with ambiguity and what's more the artist can't deny his own dodgy implication in, in what he shows this one's called no one has seen us and this, I think, this figure on the on the far left, raising his glass with his pigtail, um, is very likely to be Goya. I'm not the only commentator who, who thinks that. And he's wearing a mask to, to disguise himself, but what a devilish mask he is. Goya is drinking secretly with some corrupt venal monks. So his position is very enigmatic then, if he's the artist. It is the satirist joining in. Is he show, showing how much he too was steeped and pickled in their world? The mask in a shocking inversion being what is revealed when the face of reason slips. The monks, we might say, are divine winos, or in Castilian, de botos de la bota, or divin du vin. The print invites us to enjoy a pun. We enter a sort of verbal delirium, as, as well as a rather deliriously frightening world. So no more can we deny our implication in what we view. What, what are we looking at? What are we getting into? The captions and puns remind us how much we're always already devilishly caught in the languages we use for our experiences and intentions. How much we speakers are spoken or speak in delirious tongues. Like Trump's former spiritual advisor, Paula White, I do recommend if you really want a chilling experience, look up Paul the White on YouTube if you haven't done. Uh, she invokes flying creatures, angels above all, to come and win the presidency. And this is an image that you may have come across on your laptop or television screens. A masked figure from the, from the Capitol on January the 6th and what looks like a crucifix in the background. So where are we? Somewhere it seems like drunks on a borderline between reflectiveness and dissociation and always at risk of an explosion or overwhelm of primitive sensation. This is an earlier state for the famous Sleep of Reason print. Um, and Goya shows his own head separated from his sleeping head here as if he's, he's looking on at himself.
At the same time, though, it is humanizing imagination itself that Goya keeps alive um, in, in the sheer playful inventiveness of, of what he does and the sense of urgency at keeping it alive, even though he shows us horrors. He keeps imagination alive against all threats through his very way of telling. Well, he, 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 his own conflicting identifications, loyalties and professional allegiances, biographically, his borderline condition, and I say this metaphorically, not diagnostically, this condition came to a head after 1807, when Napoleon's armies, the representative of French enlightenment and liberty, liberty, equality and fraternity, um, invaded Spain. They crossed the great caesura of the Pyrenees, occupied Madrid, uh, and installed a puppet French ruler, Napoleon's brother, no less. During and after the French occupation, and the War of 1870-14, which we call the Peninsula War, the Spanish called it the Great War of Liberation, Goya found himself or positioned himself as employable by all sides. He painted the occupying French. He is a very dapper French military officer, painted around 1810, I think. Here's the Duke of Wellington, who finally drove the French out in 1814 looking tired and careworn as, as he would if you've just fought an incredibly long and bloody military campaign. Um, his greatest battle was still to come, Waterloo in 1815, when he finally helped bring about Napoleon's defeat. And here is the new king. We've met him before. This is the former Duke of Asturias, uh, the heir to the throne, brought back from exile in France, uh, the, the, the new king, Fernando VII. Um, Fernando was welcomed by one part of the Spanish population as the desired one, el deseado, the hoped for one. Uh, another part of the population, the part of the population that would have sympathized with, with enlightenment and French revolutionary ideals, called him the criminal king, El Rey Felon. Does that ring any bells, that sort of po political uh, resonance? In 1814, Goya painted this famous picture, one of a pair of commemorative paintings celebrating the patriots of the Great War of Liberation. The figure in the crucifix pose here, perfectly consistent with the iconography of the new, very Catholic, um, regime of Fernando VII. Fernando VII's reign was indeed one of the most reactionary mon monarchies um, at, at the, one of the most reactionary periods of European history. After Waterloo, monarchy was restored across Europe. Um, it, it was a, a repressive time in almost every European country. It's the, the, the period that Shelley and um, even Coleridge railed against in, in, in Britain. Oops. Well, Goya survived and, and lived through the conflict and re-emerged in spite of the 3rd of May as a suspected enemy of the state under the, under the restored monarchy for lots of reasons, particularly for his association with radical thinkers earlier on in the 1790s. He lost his official posts and pensions and was threatened with prosecution by the newly re-empowered empowered Inquisition. He lived in a sort of internal exile, making private works, the odd commission, and finally real exile to join with other liberal emigres and former illustrados, enlightened ones, in Bordeaux in 1824 in France, where he died at the great age of 82. Among the works he made at this time was this famous series of prints, The Dis Disasters of War. I won't say much about them, but they, they speak for themselves as images of human barbarity. And again, Goya shows us both sides. You know, Spanish patriots, guerrillas being executed by a French firing squad, an anonymous firing squad, we don't even 
We only see the tips of their, their weapons. And here are Spanish people killing French soldiers. Great deeds with bodies, with corpses. Guy is unflinching in what he shows, either what he may have actually seen or what, what, what he imagined. As if he couldn't look away, he had to do something with, with these experiences. This one is called, The Women Give Courage. It's mostly acquitted. Even in these most horrendous, bloodthirsty scenes of people in, in extremis, in, in, the, in extremes of, of physical desperation, emotional and physical suffering, what Goya brings is an extraordinary sense of life, of a, of a sort of life force. Towards the end of the series of prints, did I just say these, these were not published until 1864, well after Goya's death? There is this one called Will She Rise Again? And we might take the she to be, to be truth. Is there a world post-truth? Or are we condemned to a world of horrors? Two paintings from this period. This is the painting that Jonathan Jones wrote about in, the, in his Guardian piece called The Burial of the Sardine, made in 1816. I recommend you read Jones's excellent article. Um, it shows the, 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 end of, the end of the carnival, the February carnival, just before Lent, around the period we're, we're, we're coming to. And on the face of it, it's, it's, it's a jolly peasant scene. But again, there's a, there's a malignant jouissance about it, presided over by the, the king of the carnival, the lord of misrule himself. And note these internal spectators. This is something Goya is doing a lot around this period. No longer a head looking on in the sky as himself, but it's as if we, the spectators, and he, the painter, are included in the painting, literally. Um, echoes with the contemporary visual world are not hard to find, of course. There's the Lord of Misrule himself. I want to spend a little time, oh yeah, and also late, later on in his career, Goya satirizes the idea of carnival itself. Um, he's even more explicit into his, in, in his insight here into the other side of the joyful anarchic abandon of carnival, the liberating celebration of madness and a world turned upside down. This is the emotionally constipated, desperate and desiccated nature of what it is to be caught up in mob or group or cult think. We might call it the banality of carnival. This is from a, the late series of prints, we've seen one or two of them before, called the disparates. Dis things that just don't make sense, madnesses, things that don't hang together. But this painting I'd just like to spend a little time with. Painted in 1816, so it's a fairly small painting, called The Madhouse. So what, again, what is it? Just what are we looking at? Is it some sort of allegory? It seemed to lend itself to that sort of interpretation. Oh, it? The, um, we might be looking at the pillars of state, uh, king, church, army, in a sort of dysfunctional, sexualized conjunction. Um, sexualized indeed on, on the far side of the screen. I don't know if you can see behind your own pictures, which I can see. It looks like there's a, 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 a figure having oral sex with another figure. But you can't quite tell. That's with Guy, you're left in doubt. You're left thinking, is that just me? Am I imagining that? Ooh, it looks like that's what it is. Ooh, I don't know. So there's, there, is, there is uncanniness in which, as ever, we're implicated. There's also an internal spectator, a man with horns, 
Gaia, of course, is profoundly deaf at this time. Are they, are they horns for listening through? No, they're the wrong way around for that. Are they bull horns? It's all, all kinds of resonances to the bullfight and, and so on. Um, but it does seem to be an essay in headgear and power. The MAGA hat makes the man. And what it, what it shows is uncanny indeed. We've seen these pictures before. There they are in the White House. The, the Trump supporters, the rioters. Genuinely feeling they were doing their patriotic duty. And here are two of them. There's the treecorn hat, which you've just seen in Goya's painting. Um, as perhaps worn by a, a soldier in the uh, at the time of the signing of the American Constitution, an emblem of enlightenment, of the founding of the United States. And here's the man with horns, whom you, whom you were talking about earlier, and his headdress. So are, are we looking here at something called the real USA? The American imaginary. But let's stay with this figure a bit to think about him. His name is, um, is Jacob Chansley, but he's known, likes to, be, likes to be known as Jacob Angeli, so another flying figure. He was born in Arizona. All this information is from Wikipedia and CNN News, by the way. And he calls himself the QAnon Shaman, also known as the Yellowstone Wolf. He breached the capital, as we know, carrying a spear and wearing a coyote and buffalo horn headdress. Uh, he's, um, he's a shaman, the QAnon Shaman. I recently read uh, in, a, in a wonderful essay by the Italian writer Italo Calvino on flying and likeness, a very interesting connection between witches and shamanism and, and flight, because shamans and witches, of course, fly through the air. But the connection Calvino makes, I think, is, is, is extremely pertinent. He links it anthropologically to hardship. In tribal cultures, when things are very hard, as they, as they very often are, there is escape, rescue through flight. Shamans and witches appear in plenty, as they, as they have done in, in, the, in the Trump world. Again, I refer you to Paula White and her invocation of strange angels in her, in her church services. The allure and excitement of magical flight you could, even, you could see it at Trump rallies, I believe. There is a, the, the, the rally that Nigel Farage went to, which I think was in Arizona, when, when interviewed about it afterwards, Farage is, is almost orgasmically excited uh, in recalling the moment when Trump descended from the skies in Air Force One. All these rallies, a lot of these rallies during the election campaign were held at, at Air Force bases or, or, or airports. So the connection between hardship, flying, and, and magical cure is, is a very, a very ancient one, and, and one that's deeply embedded in, in, in figures such, such as this, such as Angeli, which is why he has, I hate to use the word because it's so overused, he has an iconic quality. He does what icons do, gathers together a lot of powerful themes that can sweep us up. Well, back to Angeli, the Yellowstone Wolf, still non shaman. He has stated his belief that televisions and radios emit very specific frequencies that are inaudible and, quote, affect the brain waves of your brain. Prosecutors have alleged that Angeli believes he is an alien or a higher being and that he's destined to ascend, ascend of course, to a higher reality. 
Well, so of course we might all happily agree he should be locked up in a mad house, shouldn't he? When asked about her son's views, uh, his mother, Martha Chansley, um, told an Arizona TV station, quote, it takes a lot of courage to be a patriot. Well, yes, don't disagree with that. It can, it can take courage to do what you believe in. Angeli also stated his belief that Freemasons designed Washington DC according to ley lines that amplify the Earth's magnetic field. And in reflecting on the Capitol storming, Angeli said, quote, what we did on January the 6th in many ways was an evolution in consciousness, because as we marched down the street along those ley lines shouting USA or shouting things like freedom, we were actually affecting the quantum realm. Well, this, this might make rather uncomfortable reading for those of us like me who are rather wedded to ideas of the field and its importance for psychoanalytic thinking, for example and who rather like making free use of myth and of metaphor in our therapeutic work. Things are beginning to get rather complex and, and confusing and are making me uneasy. So what can, what can we do about this? Well, perhaps there's worse advice than to return to Beyond's Investigate the, the Cisura. Investigate the dialectical edge, the point of leverage, or as Lacan put it, find in the very impasse of a situation the vital force of an intervention. Lacan said that in 1947. At the very least, I guess, this means to acknowledge our own ambivalences and ambiguities, that we ourselves can never be outside the field we're investigating, as Goya well understood. In other words, how much we are all Trumpists and all Democrats, at heart, we are, we are capable of both and more. We can all get carried away, as Goya seems to suggest. This is a, one of the late disparate prints of a woman and a horse, no caption. If we don't make this, this acknowledgement, that we're all Trumpists capable of being carried away in, in, in the, the violence and excitement of a jouissance. This, I think, is one of the most eloquent portrayals of jouissance imaginable. If we don't make this acknowledgement, then we merely replicate a binary, them, us, black, white, for, against. Are we able to do that? However, I don't think all this means we have to be dis disempowered by all this and paralyzed into inaction. What is needed, and this is perhaps the really important lesson to be drawn from a mere jobbing painter like Goya, is not to head straight and too quickly towards coming down on one side or the other, but rather to interrogate the forms in which messages of all kinds come to us, that which gives the messages their vital force. That's what art historians do, of course, in making formal analyses of, of visual images and how their, their shapes and lines and weights and dynamics affect us emotionally. But I think it's what we can do and need to do in our, in our lives, in our political lives particularly. Goya does this particularly in his mixture of image and text, which rarely or never support and reinforce each other straightforwardly. Indeed, as we've seen, they often contain punning and subtext and invite us to examine context. Um, some of the capriccios, for example, have additional proverbs and texts written by we don't know who, always. So we have to develop minds to make up. They help us make up our minds. They put us on the spot. We have to do some thinking. Fascism aestheticizes politics. Communism politicizes aesthetics, to paraphrase Walter Benjamin from his famous essay of 1935, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Now, I'm not putting forward an argument for 
socialist realism as, as practiced in totalitarian communist regimes. Although Goya could have been and was a very fine propaganda artist. For example, in 1814, painting the 3rd of May painting for the restored Catholic monarchy. My argument is a more Brechtian or Arentian one, Hannah Arentian, that thinking can help us. We absolutely need it when the chips are down. It's an argument for the development of critical minds through the artistic investigation of forms in the consulting room as in the studio into the way in which things are given to us. Who is speaking? To whom? Where does this message come from? What is the context, the subtext? the intertext. What is it trying to push me to think, feel, or do? What are its different facets? All this so that we're not merely and regressively, atavistically <clears throat> swept up in the message, as if it's some Trumpian or, or indeed Bidenian rally or a religious service, simultaneously full of feeling and anaesthetized to feeling. And that does seem to be a characteristic of the mob experience. There's both a, too much feeling and no feeling at all, or an, an, an anaesthetizing of feelings, an, an aesthetic experience. And in that state, we are so we so can so easily ourselves become willing, hungry swallowers of fake news and seductive personas. Good old Boris, for example, we have our very own homegrown Lord of Misrule, King of the Carnival, the Foon King of the Carnival. This is not to say that we must be dismissive, therefore, of our own gut feelings and metaphors, banish them, because we can't. We're metaphorical creatures. And if we did, that would just trap us again on one side of the binary, reason, unreason. But we can be wary of our gut feelings and metaphors, with the knowledge of what powerful vital forces they can be, so that we're in a position to make critical and ethical judgments of our own and with each other, fated as we are to be making it up as we go along, and able to keep our analytic hats on, um, to see, for example, as the historian Timothy Snyder has Trumpism as having hallmarks of 20th and 21st century fascism, the cult of a leader, the power of the mob, hatred of democracy, the telling of very large lies, and above all, racism. At the same time, we need to be able to argue, as many on the left also have, against such a reading as, his, as too simplistic or ahistorical. In other words, we need to keep the conversation and the argument going. And Goya gives us nothing if not complexity. He can finally take us much deeper, even deeper, into a nightmare world in which, in Beyond, in which, as Beyond is alleged to have said at a large group conference, the conditions are simply not right for thinking. Late in his life, or in the years around 1820, he decorated the inside of his own house just outside Madrid with murals which have come to be known as the Black Paintings. They show a dark night of the soul in which life and death battle it out, in which there almost seems to be no caesura left to transcend, just a, just a great mass of, of living human flesh, in which thought seems indeed almost impossible. He pictures civil war, internal and external. This particular image was used by the Republican side in the, the next great bloody conflict in Spain, the, the civil war of the 1930s. And in particular in this image, which I think is one of the most terrifying in the history of Western art, known as Saturn devouring his children. But the title wasn't given by Goya. We don't know what, what Goya called these images, if he called them anything. They seem to plunge us into what Lacanians call the real, 
that which is beyond symbolization. Saturn can be read as, as an allegory, as, as Saturn, for example, an allegory of a totalitarian regime devouring its own population. But it seems to offer something else, a, a surplus of horror. They don't, in the end, lend themselves to be decoded in that, in that way as symbolic or, or as allegories, although many have tried. What they give us is an experience. I think some of these images may, may be among the closest that a non-psychotic mind can come to picturing or experiencing the psychotic. They show a sort of collapse of the, of the contact barrier of the caesura, an overwhelm of, of primitive sensation. Here's a reconstruction of, of the house and the, the likely places in the house which the, the um, murals would have, been, would have been painted. I think we can think of this house as what Bion called a container, an internal space in which nightmares at least can be faced and lived with, as Goya must have lived with these day and night, and, and potentially, potentially turned into reflection. In this sense, Goya was, was literally his, his own internal spectator. So they might help us reflect on the, the great importance of our, us being able to develop an, an internal space. Or as um, one recent psychoanalyst has put it, in our, in our practices, in our therapeutic practices, being able to, to listen to our experience of listening. Well, I'd like to end on a slightly more hopeful note, as Goya himself does, with this most tender and moving of self-portraits that he made following his recovery from a recurrence of his illness in 1819. So he's an old man approaching 80 in his, in his 70s. It's, um, it's a homage to his doctor, Dr. Arietta, uh, to his doctor and, and his friend. He's in a sort of trance. It's, it's a, a painting about the transference, we, we might say. But it does offer us the, a reminder or a hope that it is possible to recover and to emerge. That knowledge, scientific knowledge, the doctor's knowledge, and, and human feeling, empathy, fellow feeling, love, love and tenderness uh, in alliance. The former guided by the latter, science guided by empathy and compassion can, um, can restore us. Well, I'll leave you with Trump confronting his enlightenment forebearers. Here he is reading something by one of the founding fathers of the United States, Alexander Hamilton, who said this in I think what, what Goya does in, 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 in summary is to show us that demons can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and we need to be vigilant about them. Historically, he challenges and expands the range of enlightenment itself, whose values we still so very much continue to, to need. Well, I shall stop there and I shall stop sharing if you've all read what Alexander Hamilton had to say. Yeah. Robert, oh. I, I was just wondering if there's any chance you could read it, Robert. It's not coming up very large enough to see on my screen. I'm, I'm on an iPad. Let's see if I can do that. I don't know if others can see it. Hamilton wrote, Will a man unprincipled in private life 
desperate in his fortune, bold in his temper, possessed of considerable talents, a very stable genius, despotic in his ordinary demeanour, known to have scoffed in private at the principles of liberty, when such a man is seen to mount the hobby horse of popularity, to join in the cry of danger to liberty, to take every opportunity of embarrassing the general government and bringing it under suspicion, to flatter and to fall in with all the nonsense of the zealots of the day, it may justly be suspected that his object is to throw things into confusion, that he may ride the storm and direct the whirlwind. Thank you. It's from the Seattle Times. Robert, th th thank you very, very much. Um, it's just an extraordinary opportunity you've given us, I think, um, for, for potentially our own thinking. Um, I mean, it's, maybe we'll, we'll see to what extent it's reflectiveness and to what extent it ends with some disassociation. Uh, but I think we're suggesting that first of all, we have a 10 minute break. Yep. So I'll leave, I'll leave this on. And uh, if, if everyone could make sure that here by um, 11.33, that would be good. Okay. Let's, let's, let's open it up to some, some comments, thoughts, questions. Robert, can I ask about um, the horse rider and the woman mm. on the horse yes. um, who's being bitten? She seems to have a smile on her face. Absolutely, yes. And I, yeah, and I, I, I was reminded of how, in the therapeutic sense of, of being in a room with somebody who is, is telling you perhaps one of their darkest thoughts, you know, the thing they shouldn't really say, and how there's the jouissance about that, you know, how we in the therapeutic context invite them to say their worst their worst of themselves and something about the jouissance in that moment yeah that's right yes yes because she doesn't look as if she's in pain when she's being bitten in that way which is yeah, that's right. been abducted by his terrifying horse the horse mm. is quite excited too wasn't mm. there a dog to one side chewing on something as well a wolf should we have a look Someone climbing in his mouth. Yes, that's right. There's, there's a sort of, it looks like it's regurgitating something, doesn't mm. it? Mm. I wasn't sure whether it was going in or out, but there was something, some, something's mouth. Yeah. Something being yes. chewed up. As, yeah. as ever, it's not clear whether something's going in or coming out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, it's got us in between borderline world again, isn't it? So much so. Well, I see this as um, the horse is not biting her, it's just taking, helping her to, to mount maybe by pulling the shirt. I guess maybe. Yeah, maybe that's what it's doing. So maybe she smiles because she's happy that she's finally getting some transportation away from whatever. From the, from the horrible dog things. There's yeah. nothing around here. I don't know. Maybe. Looks like she's just enjoying the sensation of being lifted up. She looks a bit like a skull. Could it be the rictus of death? Where? On her face. In her face, yeah. In her smile, it's not a smile, it's a skull, so skulls often appear to be smiling. I mean, it seems like a skull to me, perhaps my screen's a bit dim or something. Yeah. 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 Well, orgasm is known as the little death, isn't it? Ah, yes, the petty more. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and reading the figure on the left as a female figure being consumed by some crocodile-like monster. Hmm. A long skirt. Yeah, oh yes, that's right. Yes, there's a long skirt. What an interpretation. Yeah. Almost as if you're being eaten by your own illusions, which quite often happens to me. Yes, well, that happens to us all. We can all be eaten by our illusions. But I think the point about the excitement of 
confession in the consulting room is, is, is right too. Yeah. Before I really started practicing as a, as a counsellor even, I did some study skills work and one, one of the very first students I saw was a Greek boy. Uh, and I, I offered him a, a, an interpretation. I, I said, I, I think you're a bit of a perfectionist, aren't you? And he went, yes! Ah, I'm a perfectionist! <laughs> <laughs> so excited. This is going to say how culture interprets things. Well, but also, yes. But I, it was long before I was able to think in terms of transference and counter transference, let, let alone a, a field phenomena of what's happening in between and around us. Yeah. But, you know, what, what, what were we generating in each other, me and this, me and this boy? What, what excitement had I given him by penetrating interpretation? Mm. Taking each other for a ride. Taking each other for a ride, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Robert what came across to me so much about Goya's paintings is that he's, he's painting outsiders, um, whether they're lunatics with delusions of grandeur or witches or old women, or even it seemed to me that the picture you had of the royal family, they even they, they should be the ultimate insiders, but they seem so intensely uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, as if they don't quite belong. And that connected for me to Trump, who you would have thought as president of the United States was the ultimate insider, but he will never feel that he's an insider. He loves the trappings of being an insider, Windsor Castle, the Champs-Élysées, but any pictures of him are intensely uncomfortable. And I think that his, his supporters feel outsiders. You, you had a photograph with one of the posters saying, drain the swamp. Well, the swamp is where the insiders are. And I think that is, that is what's so fascinating about the storming of the capital that that it wasn't planned by the vast majority of people who were there. It was, there were a few determined people, but mostly it was people who felt that they were outsiders who wanted to rectify something that was, that was happening inside that was wrong. And they found themselves swept along and uh, like tourists, they were taking selfies inside the Capitol building, a place where yes, maybe they could have gone, but only with an appointment. And they didn't feel that that is where they belonged, but they, they felt they had that mixture of being an outsider and being deeply righteous about what they were doing. Uh, and then that made me think about your picture of uh, the French Revolution of the citizens storming the, 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 um, the winery or the, the cellars of the royal family. You know, this is somewhere where they should not have been. And it's such a wonderful image because it's literally intoxicating. Yep. And I think that intoxication must have been something that those tourists, I'll call them, who stormed the capital must have felt. Of, My God, uh, looks what, look what has happened to us. No, I think that's, that's all absolutely right. Yeah. Robert, thank, thank you, Sarah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I can't help but see Paul Arrego in all of this work. It's really interesting. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say, really. And um, what relationship does she have to Capitol Hill? Yes, Sorry. I wonder what sort of commentary Paul Arrego might, might make. At the three cornered hat, really. The three cornered hat. Hmm. Right in the centre of the painting. Sorry? Right in the centre of the painting, the three cornered hat. Yeah, yeah. And there is there is a very strong connection with uh, Velasquez as well, I yeah. think. In the royal family painting. Yeah which is uh, 
also looks like a sort of uh, poor man's Las Meninas. Exactly that. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a very self-conscious homage to, to Las Meninas. Yeah, and just like in, just in Las Meninas, they all seem on, on the verge of disappearing from view, sort of <laughs> fading into dust. Don't they? Yes. Yes. Interestingly, with Rago, I think she uses fantasy in her series of etchings about fairy tales that are really quite horrific. And many of the characters are flying through the air. And they look rather like those capriccios. Yes. And it, it seems to be that their both works are about the nature of delusion and uh, the response to exclusion by the excluded. In a way, in Rego, it could be women. In Goya, it's the dispossessed peasant. And on Capitol Hill, many of the people who thought they were responding to the president's call, um, not all of them, but quite a lot of them were quite poor people, quite excluded people. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah I mean, Rego is, I don't know that much about her, but except I, I think her father was a policeman, wasn't he, under the yeah. regime yes. in Portugal. So he was an, an, an instrument of the fascist state, and it, and it was a fascist state. And she worked very much against it. So, for instance, her painting of a maid polishing a uh, police sergeant's boots is right. yeah. very much on that point because it's yeah. a horrific painting. So or the, the abortion, was the painting of the abortion. Is there a painting of the abortion? Yes, yes. Um, or an etching, is it, uh, or a pastel, I can't remember. Uh, 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 there are certain imageries and I can't remember the medium. But that could be a metaphor as well, couldn't it? But it's not a bad thing. Well, there are also essays on, on power and gender. But the outsider theme. It's something about the dis excluded, the response of the excluded, which is or delusional, mm. response to be excluded to power, which is delusional. Yes. Is, is not the response of the included also very delusional? Y yes, but they're a given <laughs> in the way the act of the riot is a exceptionalism. I was thinking on those terms. Huh. A moment of uh, jouissance, I think someone called it, or uh, I can't think of another word of a, a sudden e explosion of um, whatever it was. Hmm. I feel a bit it's, it's something to do with whose truth it is, because I look at these paintings that are sort of going as a little bit sort of hallucinational paintings with people flying and monsters. But if you are hallucinating, that is your true. That's your truth there and then. Yeah. And I think the rioters, that's, they think they are bringing the truth, the, the real message, the truth. They didn't lose the, the, the votes. And I think we are easily just thinking, oh, you are hallucinating or you are a Trump supporter. So you are all wrong. Mm -hmm. But who's to say that we are not wrong? Well, because I'm not a Trump supporter, but I'm trying to sort of say, am I right? Whose, whose truth is this? That's just, I don't know what I'm going with it. It's just something I can't really get out of my head here when I watch these pictures. What, 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 I, what I wanted, I mean, I agree with all that, but what I wanted to do was see if we can go a bit beyond that. It, well, it, 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 it doesn't mean anything goes, both sides are equally right. We, we do have to make moral and, eth and ethical decisions, which are not easy. I think Hannah Arendt is very, very helpful here. Well, your comment, Robert, about literacy, that you, when you um, outlined Goya, Goya's um, cultural background, and then, you know, about a, a, a lot of uh, illiteracy and, and now, but um, that, that literacy most people are literate, but I wondered about what we mean by literacy and 
which made me also think about the crowd as a mob, but maybe the crowd is not necessarily a mob. A crowd can be very ordered. And, and so um, are the outsiders always dispossessed or um, delusional? And, or there is, is, there a, is there another common language that's quite rational in a sense that we just don't have access to? Um, and then back to your borderline, your border territory, the beyond border. I don't know, the dialogue that goes on between the two sides. I don't think we should ever underestimate the, the power of, of, of literacy to, to say, to create illiterate outsiders. The, the power of illiteracy to promote a sense of, a sense of one's outsidership. Is that in the cultural investigation of form you were referred to earlier? I think, we'd think it is, yes, yes. Mm. I, I can't imagine, I don't imagine any of us can, what it, what it must be like not to be able to read and write. Not to be able to decode the black marks of an alphabet on a page. Is there another sort of literacy as well, which is which is felt by the outsider? I wonder, you know, about they can't decode what we mean. You know, they, it's not just about the writing, but I mean, if 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 somebody that we might call an outsider was sitting listening to this, they'd just have no idea what was going on. Yeah, there are, there are cultural codes, of course. Yeah, form, forms of cultural literacy, which are very excluding. And, and shaming. Well, very shaming. Very shaming. I think mm. we yeah. Don't shame, but I think it plays a huge part in, in, in the phenomena we're, mm. we're trying to describe and get in touch with. Because it's linked with a moral high ground. Um, it might be seen to be, yeah, or, 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 or worn as such. Yes. Power. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Trump, Trump builds, you know, or thinks he's going to build a, a concrete wall. But, you know, sometimes people are excluded simply by not knowing what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's, that's, that's his tremendous appeal, I think. Yes. I but suppose the moral high ground. I mean, I think, I suppose what we're all engaged with this morning is, is trying trying not to take up a position of moral high ground. Well, yes, but how easy it is to do. I mean, I'm just well, thinking about do, Brexit yeah. and Brexit, anti-Brexit, you know, that, that yeah. there were moral high grounds taken by people who believe different things. Yeah. Um, but, but a lot of people who voted to leave felt yeah. shamed and rage yes. about the adoption of the moral high ground by people who chose to stay. Yeah, yeah. And, and very empowered. Yeah. So when, when I gave this talk before, there was an, an American woman who said, well, you, you only need a couple of words. You know, when Trump went to Michigan, in the state of Michigan, all he had to say were the words car factory and everyone was on his side. But if you worked in De Detroit or other places in Michigan, bring back the car factories, that was, that was the greatest hope. Of course you couldn't do it, but that didn't matter, all you had to do was say the words. I, I wonder whether, yeah. I wonder whether where there might be a lack of literacy then, then maybe symbols and slogans are, are given privilege to really. Yes, I think so, yeah. There's the lack of our literacy, isn't there? Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm lack of our literacy and understanding how, how powerful such encodings can be mm. in the world outside our, our own world of cultural, our, our own particular world of cultural clues and reference and points. Specifically in the consulting world. Specifically in the consulting world, yes. Yeah, where car factory for me might mean we could do with a few less of those so that we don't destroy the planet. For someone in Michigan, Absolutely, something else. It's a matter of life and death. Of yeah, bread on the table. Mm. Yeah, bread, bread on the table. Exactly. There's, some, there's something about Goya where he puts he puts the writing in with a picture, if you like, to put it simplistically. Um, so he's got you know the the language along with the image. 
And so that, yes. there's, been, there's, there's a meeting of the two, um, the two worlds, I guess. Yes. 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 Very good. That's, that's right, yes. Yeah, and you could say, you know, and about the, about the limits of verbal and written, written language. The inadequacy, because the, the, the sleep of reason produces monsters, is, is not an adequate response to the, to the image. It, it reminds me of the airbrushing of things about, you know, about the, who decides what we watch, watch after nine o'clock watershed, what's, what's okay and what's not okay. I think that came up on our Thursday meeting, but it's about, you know, about um, chicken licking and the sky fell in and actually it was airbrushed out because it was felt to be um, too damaging to the children's psyche, but how Grimm's fairy tales, et cetera, et cetera, are quite horrific, but um, aided the child in their development, but it's all been airbrushed out to this um, sort of homogeneous, um, sanitized um, world, but yeah. my God, what lurks underneath. Yeah all around and Goya is so refreshing in that and you know I yeah right. yeah I think it's so important we, we need to be able to face our nightmares together though but the also point. the borders that is it Cesar you called it a border the this border the between yeah. um asleep and awake and the border between lies and truth and the border between writing and image and who and how can read those things seems to be really to the forefront in Goya and the now. Yeah. Yeah. The border. Yeah. Well, I, well, I um. Oh, sorry. Go on, Dan. I was just wondering about the um, these images, Im imagery, and symbolism, and how maybe has been pushed forward by the lack of or inability of people to speak about say Trump voters, more than 70 million people, you know, speak about, they were afraid to even say they're going to vote for him. Uh, so they couldn't speak about, so what's that about? And maybe this rise of imagery of symbolism, maybe in, you're talking about two words, Tr Trump spoke at some kind of uh, the car, whatever you said before, two words, but maybe that's be because all the words have been censored and cut and, and maybe even misinterpreted or uh, the more words you use, the more there were kind of the media or, or uh, you know, every media was s uh, making it as, as the opposite, you know. So there are no more words. How can you speak about something that you feel about if there's no more word, if there's no possibility to speak about it? I mean, people who voted for Trump, I know people in America, loads of them who voted, they were afraid that the workplace asked them, are you going to vote for, well, who are you going to vote? And they said, no, no, I'm not going to vote with anybody because they were afraid to say what they were going to, you know, or not, or they, they were afraid. Fascinating. Yes. I, I wonder if there's also something about language that people are so bombarded with it that it stops making any stops making any sense. You know that they can't. It doesn't help them to think. Yeah. Because what's being said to them you can't distinguish what it means or whether it in, indeed even has any meaning. That's, yes, so, the, the language itself becomes suspect and, and the more apparently yes. and very often for good reason. You know, we are surrounded yes. by what George Orwell called newspeak. Mm. Um, mm. We consume you know, absolute bollocks from... Mm. You know. I've just published a book, for example, and I, I, the, the proofreader is employed by a Dublin-based company. And I looked them up and looked up their manifesto. And it is incredible that these people are, are, are employing people to proofread books. You know, I was hoping in my book I was trying to make some sense. But it was pure corporate huge corner bollocks. Um, you know, we, 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 we deliver high-grade deliverables, that sort of sentence. 
if you if if that's if I was lived in the Midwest and that's what I heard coming from the mouths of Washington politicians, this sort of nonsense speak of big, big words that sound nice, which went over my head and made me angry. I'd, I'd, I'd want fewer words, I think, or just a few words that did make some sense that I could hold on to. Mm. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a very good book by Christopher Bolas. This is your psychoanalytic term, I think, isn't it? Those of you who are studying on, on Dell's course. Um, Dell and Jane and Dell's course. Um, Christopher Bolas wrote a book whose name I've still forgotten, in 2018. Meaning and Melancholia. Yes, that's it, Meaning and Melancholia, in which there's a, there's a chapter on his, on the state of self losing, which I think is North or South Dakota. Yes. Um, and it's part of the great news desert of, of middle America. Um, new, newsprint has, has pretty much vanished. There are no local newspapers. It's all, all, all screen-based stuff. In any case, um, rural people tended not to read the papers anyway. They didn't trust what the state said. They certainly didn't trust what the, what the federal state said. They had no idea what the rest of the world said and no, very little interest in it. Mm. Information and, and trust were established by word of mouth at the top of the hand. And what, what, what the guy in the, in the hairdresser or in the bar said, or what, what, what the woman in the nail counter said. You could trust them, they were, they were, they were our, our people. And that seems such an important insight. Well, uh, he makes the point that, that Donald Trump spoke in their language. Exactly. So his little phrase, which was exactly what you'd hear in the bar, what Trump would say, I don't know, but I hear. Yeah. And yeah. Ordinary, ordinary, ordinary guys speak. Yeah. Yeah. And he's brilliant at it. Absolutely brilliant at it. Yes. It tells us something, doesn't it, though, about how, how you can forget to communicate, how, how you can forget to communicate, how you can forget that you might be speaking a different language mm. to somebody else. Mm. Yeah. You know, that they're, because their points of reference are just not the same. Yeah. Well, isn't that important for the consulting room? Yes. Mm. You know, aren't, aren't we privileged to have such a, a manageable space? You know, all hell can break loose in the consulting room, of course, but at least it's, it's contained in... Uh, the, forces, the forces in the consulting room. Continue. continue. Yeah, the forces in the consulting room that are contained are so powerful. Yeah. I that it, that, that, I mean, the outsider also that the sense of grievance that the narcissist feels that we can encounter in the room and look at the power of that out in the world when someone like Donald Trump has such a sense of, he is a narcissist and such a sense of grievance and that communicated, whether it's through words or, or, or tweets or whatever, is so, so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Wonder it's uh, we're at time, uh, so it's it's twelve o'clock. And Robert, um, I wondered if you wanted to conclude, and I wondered if you've got a book coming out, haven't you? Yes, I, did, I shamelessly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have they come back to the main screen where we can all see each other. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, I want you. To, I want you to look at my my bit of self publicity first. I just realised. <laughs> <laughs> if. If, if you want to, if you want to pursue this kind of argument, but in a, in a, in a, with a different artist, this, this, I've just published this book, Cezanne in the post Bionian Field. And the, the, if, you, if you did want to buy it, you wanted 20% off, it's FLR40 at checkout. So there you go, Routledge. Okay. And if, if, any, if anyone wants to be in touch, that's my email address there. Robert, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> I I was particularly taken by um, your you said something about Gaia changing the titles under a series of etchings. I think from dreams to snitches. <laughs> what? And, yeah. Was it something like that? 
Well, Snitches was the title of one of the caprices, yeah. yeah. The, 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 orig the original title for the whole lot was going to be Dreams. Yes. Well, it just, it's maybe, for me, it's, it's something about from Dreams to Snitches and from to sh Snitches which are shared. <laughs> and it, it, I was struck by the conversation at the end about the consulting room and can we speak a similar language, if only for a moment, those snitches. Yeah. And, and it seems that, you know, what you're opening up for us is that, that possibility of looking at ourselves, you know, on the idea that the, that the, the greatest resistance in the consulting room is in the therapist, you yeah? and in the therapist's ability to communicate. Uh, and it seems that what you've done is given us a, a most amazing opportunity to, to wonder about this with regard to ourselves. Um, as therapists and and to even to you know mentioned earlier uh, about the um, you know whether it goes to reflectiveness or disassociation yeah. what we might take to consider to be reflectiveness and disassociation yeah, yeah? yeah. Um, we'll we'll be looking um, shortly in this group as at the issues of of you know the Trump in all of us um, as a way of trying to find a place to get to that I think you're suggesting <laughs> to balance, to be somewhere to, yeah, you know, there's a whole issue about our own values and where they come from and how they work appropriately and inappropriately in the consulting room. So thank you so much for starting us on re-looking re -looking at that. Uh, can we just all thank Robert very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, our, our visitors today. Um, we do have another talk next Thursday. Um, uh, 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 Mar Martin Martin Stanton will be talking about his, his new book called Still Life. Uh, that's next Thursday um, at six or seven thirty p.m. So. If I could ask the people who've come to thank you very much, the visitors for coming, uh, we're going to carry on with our own programme now and uh, hope to see you another time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.